scripture passage for today. This is from Romans chapter 12. And so if you want to join me in your pew Bible, it's on page 123 in the pew Bible. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 3. It reads, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before Megan and I had kids, we had the wonderful opportunity of taking a trip, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to Israel, with some friends from our church in California. And um, it was amazing. It was incredible. We learned so much about all the places that Jesus actually walked while he taught all the stories that we've learned so well. And I'm sure I'm gonna get to share more about that someday. But uh, one of the things that we saw that amazed me was this tall arched structure. Now at the time I was living in Southern California and so to me, it looked like a freeway overpass, but that's actually a Roman aqueduct. And so we climbed onto it and walked across a few hundred yards of it as our guide told us facts about how the Romans had constructed these all across their empire. Because you can find them today in France, in Spain, in Greece, in Turkey, in North Africa, as well as in modern day Israel. Now at the top, it was probably about eight feet wide and it was incredibly straight. And the precision of its construction is what impressed me the most. Um, Aqueducts were things that had been used um, even earlier than Rome in ancient India and in ancient Egypt to bring water from a freshwater source to a nearby town or village. But the Romans had innovated and improved upon the idea, so much so that the ancient historian Pliny the Elder actually said that the aqueducts of Rome were a marvel that were unsurpassed. Um, In his work called Natural History, Pliny the Elder said that there is nothing to be found more worthy of our admiration throughout the whole universe. See, the Romans knew that access to water was what allowed for life to flourish. And so they didn't just dig a trench and reroute a stream a little bit, you know, to just irrigate a field nearby. No, they constructed tunnels They constructed surface channels and canals. They constructed covered clay pipes and monumental bridges to deliver water throughout their empire, enabling towns to turn into cities and transforming areas that previously were desolate and barely inhabited into thriving communities. And so it was awesome for Megan and I to see some of the same structures that Jesus and his disciples encountered in their travels around Israel. Because remember, Jesus and his disciples were from the country. They were a group of rural boys. And so every time they'd go into Jerusalem for some big festival or for the Passover, they marveled at the large stone structures and the hustle and bustle of a big city. Now on one such occasion, Jesus and his disciples were visiting the temple in Jerusalem And they were sitting nearby to the treasury, which had large boxes that collected money offerings from pilgrims and visitors to the temple. And the boxes were made out of wood, and they had these bronze openings that kind of looked like a vase or maybe like an upright trumpet pointing straight up in order for people to toss in their coins. So I want to read for you this short passage from the Gospel of Mark, okay? So this is Mark, uh, starting in verse 41 of chapter 12. It says, he sat down, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this 
poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, today we are continuing our series called God of Abundance, where we're looking at how God is able to provide for our needs and how he works in us and through us to provide for the needs of others. And we're also in our society in this season of thanks and giving. You know, it's a beautiful season where we're getting ready for Christmas. We're thinking about the people we love and what types of gifts we might want to get for them. But this season brings with it a lot of usually stress and worry as well. It's normal to be thinking of Christmas presents that we might want or wondering how we're going to afford gifts for everyone in our family this year or realizing that no matter where you turn, every display in every store is trying to tell you that you need something new and shiny to make you satisfied this year. And so it's this season that carries with it the burden as well as the joy. And so that's why we're going to be looking at this passage from the Gospel of Mark today, along with the other one I read at the beginning from Romans. And we're going to discover that when we trust God as our provider, we'll realize that everyone has something to give. That's actually what I titled today's message, Everyone Has Something to Give. So let's return to Jesus and that widow. We know that the temple was usually crowded with people. And the treasury was located in the outer court, also known as the women's court, because that's as far as the women could go. They couldn't go into the inner court. Only the men could go into the inner court to wash animal sacrifices and be closer to the actual building of the temple. And so in this outer court, everyone is milling about. We have Gentiles who wanted to worship Yahweh, and they're peering in from the outside colonnades. And Jewish women are trying to find a quiet spot to uh, pray and worship God. And men and boys are coming and going, uh, lining up to get into the inner court where they could worship closer to the temple building itself. So it's almost as if our atrium before service, and there's cake, and there's talking, and there's music happening in here, and some people are coming and going. And this is where Jesus is, and he's sitting and watching. And so there's maybe as many as 12 or 13 of the treasury boxes around the perimeter so that it would be a common occurrence to hear the clang of coins against the bronze openings as people deposit their offerings. So there's noise, there's prayers. You hear individual clangs as people toss in a coin or a few. And every once in a while, there's a rich person who walks up with a big old sack of coins. But of course, they're not just going to put the sack into the bucket. They're going to open up that sack and drop them in one by one so you can hear each and every clang across the courtyard, right? My, how impressive. 37 clangs. How rich they are. How blessed they are by God. And how devout they must be. But Jesus doesn't bring attention to those people. Instead, he points out the poor widow who probably went unnoticed by everyone else. She probably snuck up to the closest treasury box and just tossed in her two small coins. Now she had two because she had exchanged her currency at the entrance to the temple. The smallest Roman coin was worth two of these Jewish copper coins. And when she put them in the treasury box, they probably barely made a tinkling sound. She was probably embarrassed. No large clang for her. No people stopping in the courtyard to look around to see who is giving the impressive gift. But Jesus notices, and he points it out to his disciples. He says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the rest. For all of them contributed out of their abundance. They had more than enough, and so they brought the extra to the temple as an impressive display. And then he continues, he says, but this woman out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, I want you to realize that Jesus isn't emphasizing the fact that she gave all she had, as if she, he's saying that everyone should give all of their money in order for God to be happy. No, he's pointing out the size of the woman's gift. Everyone else in the court was impressed with loud clangs, large gifts, but Jesus 
is impressed with the largeness of the gift based on the heart of the one who gives it. See, the others, he said, took care of themselves first. And then, out of the extra, gave some of it to the temple, gave some of their extra to God. See, Jesus is redefining the size of the gift to be subjective to each person. God doesn't see individual size comparisons between people. He sees each heart of each individual. His concern isn't with the amount that we give. His concern is with the condition of our hearts and whether we're holding back a part of ourselves, holding back some of us from the cleansing transformation that God is offering. And so I want us now to flip back over to that passage in Romans. It's on page 123 in your pew Bible again, because we're going to see how Paul expands this idea further. Now, remember, Paul is writing to the believers in Rome who are gathering together to try and follow Jesus in the midst of a culture that values power and size and impressiveness. And when they gather to worship Jesus, there's some of them who are involved in leading the gatherings by teaching others, and some are leading by hosting the gatherings in their larger houses. But if you weren't a good public speaker, or if you weren't rich enough to have a big house, well, then it felt like you didn't have anything to offer. But remember, everyone has something to give. So let's see how Paul teaches this to us. He starts in verse three by saying, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but according to the measure of faith that God has, ins- has assigned. See, rather than comparing ourselves to some outside standard that we've set up, or rather than comparing ourselves to each other, we ask, how does God see me? How has he assigned faith to me to carry out his work? And then Paul continues by talking about the gathering of believers like a body. See, just like our bodies have different parts that work together, so the body of Christ is supposed to have different parts that work together. We're not supposed to be gifted the same. Being different is a blessing, and everyone has something to give. See, too often in the church, we think that certain gifts are more important than others, right? There are certain types of gifts and skills that are more visible than others. They clang louder. And it's easy to assume that those are the only gifts that matter. Public speaking, leading the music, teaching, being able to give lots of money. We think that these are the most important gifts. And if we don't have those gifts then maybe we aren't as important to the body of Christ. Maybe we aren't as needed. But God doesn't compare us to each other like that. No, he's not standing at the end of the line with a basket just receiving all of our gifts and then judging us based on whether or not we gave as much as the person before us. That's not what God does. I mean, that's what we do, right? We compare ourselves with each other all the time based on the end product of what we can offer. But God looks at the heart. God doesn't look at what we give. He looks at what he's given to us and how we're using it. So Paul continues in verse six. He says, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Our gifts are different according to the grace that God has given to us. In other words, God has freely and graciously given us gifts, things that we haven't and and couldn't earn. They're given just because of God's generosity. See, on our own, we don't got no gifts. It's only because of God's grace. So any gift that we have should prompt a thank you, not a jealousy of, oh, why don't I get the gift that they got? It's a thank you. I mean, why would we compare something that we have to give to the gift that someone else has to give. It's a blessing that we're different and God designed it that way so that we can each work together so that the whole body can join in God's mission the way that we're called to do. So when I say to you that everyone has something to give, that means that God has given you a gift that is needed. God has given you a gift that is important in the kingdom of God. 
And Paul mentions just a few of the types of gifts that God can give to his people so that they can join him in his work. And so he starts going through these, and he starts with prophecy in proportion to faith. Now, the Greek word that's translated for, for prophecy here means to interpret divine will or to interpret divine purpose. It's the idea, it's the ability to recognize whether God is leaning in a certain direction, right? It's the type of people, maybe you know some like this, who just have that knack for knowing how God is working. Like maybe you've been talking with a friend about what's going on in your life and maybe they respond with, wow, it really sounds like God's trying to teach you something about that right now. And they just have this knack for recognizing when God is leaning in a direction. That is in the vein of the prophetic gift. It's growing in the ability to recognize when God is leaning close, even if we don't have all the details. And so the next gift that Paul mentions is the gift of ministry, which he says should be used in ministering. Now, the word that's used for, for ministry means to perform a service for someone, or it could mean preparing God's people for productive service. And we all know people who have this gift, right? People who are servant-hearted, People who uh, even have the gift to come alongside others and help train them to grow in that ability as well, right? And so Paul is saying that if you have the gift to notice the needs of others, and if you have the heart to step in and serve, then do it. And if you have the gift to manage a team that works together towards serving, well, then do that. Now, the next gift that Paul talks about in our list is teaching which can either mean teaching a big group about a topic like I'm attempting to do right now, or it can even be teaching a child their letters or teaching a neighbor a new skill around the house or maybe teaching a friend how to follow a recipe. If you have the gift to be patient with someone as they're learning something for the first time, Paul says, use that to build each other up because it glorifies God. And next he says that the exhorter should use their gift in exhortation. Now, exhortation means encouragement, but it could also mean making an appeal on behalf of someone, or it could mean to comfort someone. So if you have the gift of exhortation, that means that you know how to use words to help someone. You know how to use words to lift them up to a bar or to lift them up to a new standard, calling them to step up. Or maybe you know how to use words to cheer them up or you know how to use words to point them up to the Lord. The next gift that Paul talks about is the gift of giving. He says that the one who is gifted as a giver should use that gift with generosity. Now, the word for generosity that Paul uses here could also be translated as simplicity or sincerity or frankness. In other words, Paul is encouraging people who have the gift of giving to use that gift but to do it out of simple goodness, which gives without reserve, without strings attached, without any hidden agendas. Give because God has given you the gift of being a giver. Now, this could be with finances, but I've known people who have the gift of giving notes or text messages, right? They think of someone, and they send a little message to let them know that they're thinking of them. Or like my wife, if she sees something while she's out at the store that she thinks that my mom would like, she takes a picture of it to send it to her mother-in-law. And that's one way of connecting and, and being in the, in the same vein as a gift of giving, connecting with a person. Paul then says that the one who has been gifted as a leader should use that gift diligently. They should use their gift with an earnest commitment. They should lead with, with eagerness, with willingness, and all of us have known leaders who are gifted like this, right? Who've demonstrated zeal and excitement with their opportunity to lead well. We love to serve under leaders like that who want to be there. And maybe you've also met a leader or two that comes to your mind right now who didn't seem all that happy to be there. Or maybe they seemed too busy to be bothered. And we've felt the difference of serving under both those different types of leaders. And then Paul rounds out his list of examples by saying that anyone who's been given the gift of compassion should use their gift in cheerfulness. To be compassionate means to have mercy on others. And it's closely related to serving others, right? And cheerfulness, of course, means gladness, wholeheartedness, 
Graciousness is the, is the opposite of being under duress or pressure. Paul is saying, if you've been gifted with a heart of compassion for others, let it be something that you're able to use with gladness. Not in a state of have to or obligation. Those, those would be good indicators. If you're feeling pressure to have mercy on someone, that's a good indication that maybe you're not serving in the right gift at the right time. But this, this list of gifts that Paul lays out here, this is not an exhaustive, this is not the total list of gifts. They're just examples to get our minds going to see, well, how everyone, how God gives everyone gifts that are meant to be used to join him in his work. We're not supposed to be gifted the same, but rather it's when our different gifts mix together that we can see how God is at work in our church family and through us as we bless our neighborhoods and community. Now, that's why we don't have to get fixated on our gift and wonder why we don't have the same gift as someone else, as if it makes us less valuable or more valuable to God. Because God isn't the one who's standing up here judging the gifts that we bring to the table. No, God is standing at the beginning of the line He's the one who's giving us our gifts and then sending us to share those gifts in ways that he intends. See, we are God's aqueducts to bring needed water to dry places so that life and flourishing can happen there. We are the conduits that deliver God's prophetic words of life and truth, that deliver God's acts of service, that deliver God's instruction. See, we're not buckets that just collect the gifts that God gives to us in order to just hold them. No, we're the conduits that convey God's encouragement and comfort that lifts people up to a new level, that deliver God's gifts to where they are needed most. We're the conduits that deliver God's simple generosity that gives without holding back, that delivers God's leadership, that, that, that cares for others with eagerness and diligence. See, we're the conduits that get to deliver God's mercy wholeheartedly. And when we look at how God commended the woman in our first passage, he he didn't look at what her gift was or even the size of it. He commended her because she gave it all for God. Everyone has something to give. God has given you a gift that is needed And he's inviting you to use your giftings and give it all to the work that the Lord has put in front of you. But let me tell you, giving it all does not mean putting your family or yourself in harm's way or in a state of lack, all in the name of duty. See, our God of abundance has given us everything we have and he's given it to us to be used for the responsibilities that he's put in front of us. And so that means caring for and providing for our families. That's a great use of the gifts that God has given to us. It means planning for their future. So college funds or sports opportunities or retirement accounts or or saving for that family trip that you know is gonna create beautiful memories together, that's a great use of the gifts that God has entrusted to us. Investing in kingdom opportunities that God puts in front of us, those are great uses of our gifts that he gives to us. Caring for ourselves, ensuring that we are healthy physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Those are great uses for the gifts that God gives us. See, recognizing that all we have has been given to us by God makes us realize that he's given it to us for a purpose. He's given it to us to be used for the things that he's inviting us to do as we continually learn how to join him in mission in our everyday lives. See, Whenever church leaders talk about generosity or stewardship or giving to God, everyone's mind immediately goes to money. And in my experience, that usually leads to defensiveness or shame from people who don't think they give enough, or it leads to pride in the people who think they give a lot. See, there's a reason that Jesus talks about money a lot because he knows how powerful money is and how it affects our hearts. But he also knows each person individually. And so that's why he encouraged one rich young ruler to give everything he had, while at the same time he rejoiced when Zacchaeus gave up half of what he had. Jesus looks at the heart, not at the size of the gift. And so 
that's why I still want to encourage you to make it a habit to, to tithe here at church, to practice giving financially to the ministry that God is doing here because that's one way that Jesus can work on our hearts to heal us and transform us into the type of people who aren't captured by our finances, but who are captured by the grace and abundance of God, who know that he is able to provide for us. And that's why he entrusts gifts to us to be used for his purposes. See, that's why my wife Megan and I tithe to, the, to support the ministry that God's doing here at New Life. It, it, it's a spiritual habit. We do the habit to help us learn the principle because I don't want to get so attached to my money. It's too easy. I know how, how capturing that is. And so it's a habit that we do so that we don't forget that all of it came from God anyways. It's all a gift. So tithing to the church or donating to a nonprofit or picking up some extra groceries when you're at the store so that you can donate some of it to the food bank, all those are good habits that help us learn that God is a provider. Those are habits that God uses to teach us so that we learn how to be a conduit and not just a bucket. Because the gifts that God gives to us, it's, it's life-giving water. And those gifts are meant to flow through us to the work that the Lord has put in front of us, not just sit in a bucket of our lives. Because do you know what happens to water when it is stagnant? It grows stale. It breeds pests and algae, right? But God has given you a gift that is meant to be used. So this week, I want you to ask yourself, what is a gift that God has entrusted to me? Now, I'm sure he's given all of us many gifts. But for this week, this week just think of one. What is a gift that God has entrusted to me? And how can I deliver it to where God wants to use it this week? I mean, maybe he's bringing to your mind an opportunity to invest some more of your time and talents into your family. Maybe he's inviting you to grab that bucket of resources and stir it up and, and send it to support the ministry that's happening here at the church. And, and honestly, right now, I want to pause here. I want to thank all of you who are committed, regular givers for the ministry here. It's thanks to your commitment and generosity that we're able to partner with Jesus and join Jesus in providing youth groups for teens. We're able to support international missionaries. We're able to partner with church plants here in the U.S., we're able to be involved here in the Sauk Valley in ways that point to the goodness and mercy of Jesus. And so I want to thank you for being committed to this church family, committing your finances to the ministry that God is doing here in and through our church. See, the good news is that our God of abundance continually blesses us by providing for us and giving us gifts to be used. He gives us what we need to take care of our families, but he doesn't stop there. He gives us gifts of all kinds that are meant to be a blessing to the world around us. Gifts of words, gifts of service, of patience, of mercy. And when we give all we have been given, adding it to the mix of gifts that God has sent through others, it creates transformation in our community and our world. And it shows just how good God is so that others can be drawn towards him to receive the gift of his mercy and his healing and love. So no matter what gifts God has given to you, no matter how big or small they seem, no matter how loud or quietly they clang, God has given you gifts that are needed and he has a role for you in the work that he's accomplishing through our family here at New Life. And isn't that good news? Amen, amen.